Out of all the Harry Potter video game ports out there, the PlayStation 1 version is the one that gets talked about the most. And so today, we're going to be seeing if the game was actually any good, or if we're all just blinded by nostalgia. We're first greeted with a storybook cutscene, very similar to the PC port, but this one's so much more fancy. It has a full 3D environment, page turns, and it's all in colour too! Because apparently the PC wasn't capable of that. With the amount of detail they've added here, I can't wait to see the rest of the game. Oh my god! Welcome to Hogwarts, home to horrifying humans! Quirrell looks like he's just been squeezed out by the night bus, and Mrs. Norris looks like she's just had 5,000 volts blasted through her. And you know how when you try to wrap the tinfoil back over your easter egg, but no matter how hard you try, it never goes back the same? Well that's PS1 Hagrid for you! We make our way to the Gryffindor common room, where we meet Fred and George, who introduce us to this game's bean system. Here, you are asked to collect different coloured beans, and in return, you'll get a password to a secret portrait and win a prize. I think having that element of mystery was a great idea, and it really encouraged me to grab every bean I could find. We'll discuss the rewards a little later on, as right now we have to rescue Hedwig, who's been captured by Malfoy. This might have been a relatively straightforward task if the architect hadn't been sniffing glue. Seriously, where are the stairs? That is some next level hatred. Not only is Malfoy willing to climb all the way up here, he done it while carrying an owl under his arm. This section acts as a tutorial for the basic mechanics of the game. Jumping and climbing is done automatically, and this is where we can see Harry's true power, defying the laws of gravity. <laughs> we then come across nearly headless Nick, who teaches us Flipendo. And if you really think about it, it's kind of funny that the most essential spell in the game is taught to you by a ghost rather than in the classroom. I guess the other first years are going to have a really rough time navigating through this castle. Eventually we find Hedwig and let her out of the cage, but as it happens, she could have let herself out the entire time through the giant hole in the wall behind her! Thanks a lot. I've only been here for 5 seconds and I'm already physically exhausted. Off we go to broomstick practice, where we are subjected to possibly the worst flying controls I've ever come across. It might not look that difficult considering how slow everything's moving, but everything feels so delayed to the point that when you have to make a sharp turn, you'll find yourself smashing left and right hoping to try and get back on course. Look at the state of this! Would you want him on your team? After that humiliating attempt at flying, we meet Hermione, who tells us that we've got to go to charms class. But before we can do that, we have to watch her running down the corridor for 15 seconds. You know, just in case we couldn't find the only door that's there. Getting to each class involves you going through a time trial with some light platforming thrown in. This normally involves you jumping on floating objects or pushing blocks using flipendo. Funnily enough, the one class that doesn't require you to do this is potions. And you would think Snape would love making all the kids suffer by potentially falling and breaking their necks. Makes you wonder who the real villains are, eh? To learn a spell, you have to complete a rhythm minigame, which would make sense if Harry then later auto-casted like he does in the PC version. But here, everything is a bit inconsistent. With Verdomilius, you just hit X and you're done. Cool. When guarding Leviosa, you move the object to the correct place. Makes sense. Then there's Avaforce and Incendio, which forces you to do a button pressing minigame every time you cast it. So, what is the point in doing this? I'd also like to add that casting Incendio traumatised me as a child. I'd get stuck trying to cast the spell for ages and back then, I just thought I sucked at gaming, but no, even now this is a complete nightmare. Because as it turns out, there's a delay when you try to hit the button, and every time you miss, you're forced to step back. This feels like a punishment Snape would give out. Let's talk about exploring the castle for a second, because compared to the PC version, this game takes a step in the right direction. And then it takes a step back. Some areas you can explore whenever you like, such as the castle grounds and the dungeons, but then other areas will get locked behind you, never to be seen again. Sometimes you're allowed to go to the next stage at your own pace, and then other times you're whisked away to the next level without a choice. As much as I was disappointed with the PC version being so linear, at least it was consistent. Speaking of inconsistencies, let's add the frame rate to the list. While it's fine for the most part, there are some areas where it will plummet harder than Lily Potter's corpse. Now, areas like the Great Hall, while the drop in frame rate is a little annoying, I can kind of live with it since the only thing to do is collect a few beans on the tables. This area, on the other hand, requires you to make very precise jumps or else you'll fall and take damage. 
a stable frame rate is kind of a necessity there. Although it would be less problematic if Harry could just jump up that ledge. I've seen you jump higher, dude. Why are you making life so difficult for yourself? There are a number of secret rooms scattered about, but instead of using Alohomora to open them, you simply walk up to the secret passage and hit the square button. Actually, secret might not be the best term to use. That wall looks pretty conspicuous. What's nice about these rooms is that they normally contain a minigame where you can win a wizard card as opposed to the bare looking rooms in the PC version. The only issue is that you will soon realise that you can predict which minigame you are going to find depending on what part of the castle you're in. For example, the Hogwarts grounds will have you collecting beans while avoiding bouncing bulbs, and the dungeons will have you move cauldrons onto burners. And I have to ask, why is Nick hiding in these areas in the first place? And why does he need all these cauldrons shifted? Oh, one thing that I forgot to mention in my last review was the music, which is completely different to what you hear in the films, but to me, it's equally as iconic. This game was scored by Jeremy Soule, who also wrote the music to games like Knights of the Old Republic, Guild Wars, and the score he's probably most well known for, Disney Princess Magical Jewels. Oh yes, and Skyrim. Tracks like Happy Hogwarts are ingrained into my brain, and I still listen to them on a regular basis. Honestly, it really helps set the atmosphere and makes Hogwarts feel like a magical place. It's a shame this port doesn't utilise it all that much. Get used to the sound of Harry's squeaky footsteps because you're going to be hearing that a lot. Now don't get me wrong, sometimes not having music can be equally as effective in creating an atmosphere. In fact, I think the lack of music in the dungeons is a great fit as it feels very eerie. However, it probably would have felt more eerie if we weren't already conditioned to a lack of music in other areas. It just makes the whole castle feel cold and empty. This is supposed to be a magical school, not an abandoned ruin. Just watch what happens when I take this clip and slap some happy Hogwarts on it. Tell me that doesn't just make you feel warm and fuzzy inside. We try to leave the castle, but Malfoy decides he hates us so much that he's going to block the doorway. So naturally, Harry blasts him to the other side of the room. This doesn't sit well with Malfoy, so he retaliates by throwing explosive wizard crackers that just so happen to be in his pocket. He's lucky he didn't fall on his ass and paint the wall with his innards. Once you beat him, we're treated to this classic joke. Which they somehow got wrong. Looks like Malfoy took one too many crackers to the head and forgot what house he belongs to. We then get this animation about the house points which pop up a few other times in the game, and despite the fact that it's only a minute long, it's the longest minute you'll ever have to sit through, especially when you remember that the house points are absolutely worthless because Gryffindor will always win. After we attend Herbology class, Hagrid asks us the teeny tiny favour of jumping over lava to grab some fire seeds. Luckily, we avoid becoming the next Anakin Skywalker, but unfortunately for us, there's no time to rest, as we have to chase Malfoy all around the school to get Neville's remember all. This is followed up by McGonagall coming up to you like, Welcome to the Quidditch team! Hurry up, there's a game on in five minutes! Gee, I wonder why Gryffindor hasn't won a game in years! They seem so organised! Also, does this mean that they've not had a seeker this entire time? If they did, that's going to be a bit of an awkward conversation. Hey you! We know you've been practicing for days, but we just thought we'd replace you with this first year who doesn't know what a snitch is! Oh no, sorry, I tell a lie. Harry knows all about Quidditch because Hagrid gives him a book about it when you give him the fire seeds. A book that Harry hasn't had a chance to read. Just to top it off, after the match, Snape claims that this is a library book and I quote, Library books, by definition, are not to be taken from the library. Someone ought to break it to him that that's exactly how library books work. This eventually leads us to the dungeons, where we're introduced to the potion making mechanic. This is something that I wish was present in the PC port, however, despite its inclusion here, it's terribly implemented. First of all, you have to find yourself a cauldron and do yet another button pressing minigame, which is fine, but the only thing you can brew are health potions. This might not have been a problem if it wasn't for the fact that chocolate frogs also restore your health, and there are a lot more of them scattered around than cauldrons, so by the time you come across one, health isn't that big of an issue. At this point in the game I notice I finally have enough Bertie Bot's beans to trade with Fred and George. 
Now I've been looking forward to this moment since the idea was mentioned at the start of the game, and what do we get? Quidditch armor! You know, for those Quidditch sections that we get to play two, maybe three times? And we've already played one of them. Not the best prize, but it's okay. I've got enough to unlock another one. Let's see what's in here. A wizard card! Because we haven't already seen those. Okay, it's fine. There's another two to unlock. Let's just try the next one. Ah, the Nimbus 2000. Are you f***ing kidding me? More Quidditch gear? Here's an interesting question. If these two come from such a broke family, why are they buying the most expensive Quidditch items, stuffing it into the back of a portrait and trading it for beans? We've got one more portrait for us to check out, but before we can do that, we first have to attend Transfiguration, then chase Peeves to get a parcel back which contains the invisibility cloak, which, by the way, would be a lot easier if the camera would just let me see where I'm going. <laughs> How the hell is that fair? Once we do that, we have a stealth section where we have to sneak past Filch using the invisibility cloak. But why? It's never explained. The PC port had a very similar section, but that's set at night when students aren't allowed to wander the castle, and the reason Harry is out of bed is so he can sneak Norbert off to Ron's brother Charlie. The PlayStation version, on the other hand, just has Filch saying, Kids shouldn't be here! And then Harry's like, Oh yeah? Also, the way that the cloak works here is a little odd, because in order to remain invisible, you need to find these invisibility tokens scattered around the level. Wait a minute. This game was published by EA. This must be where they got the idea for microtransactions! We then get a cutscene about the Mirror of Erised, followed by the troll chase to the girls' bathroom. Not much to say here, since it's pretty much the same idea as the PC version, although someone really needs to fire the cleaner, because there's green goo everywhere. By the time we reach the girls' bathroom to save Hermione, we have this awful section where we need to use Flopendo so we don't get hit in the head with a toilet. But... Well, look at it! Can't see because Harry's head's in the way. And if that wasn't bad enough, the controls feel all floaty. By the time I've finished the troll section, I realise I have enough beans for the final portrait. And as luck would have it, Fred and George are standing right in front of me. We also get a note from McGonagall about a Quidditch match starting soon, so I think, okay, cool, let me just grab this portrait and I'll be right over. What? No! Come back! How cruel is that? They were dangling Fred and George right in front of me like, oh, you want to trade those beans? You want to find the next secret? Well, screw you! I guess this gives us a chance to try out the Nimbus 2000, and here's a shocker, it makes absolutely no difference! I think I might have forgiven the poor controls earlier if they were trying to set up the Nimbus 2000 handling better or something, but no, I felt no difference at all. Oh, and as for the Quidditch armor, I, uh, I didn't get hit. So, I guess I really didn't need it? After winning the match, Hagrid approaches us to see if we would go with him to Diagon Alley to get some stuff for Norbert. Sure thing, Hagrid. Just give me a few minutes to trade these- You hairy b All I want is five minutes to trade some beans. Is that too much to ask? Oh, and get this. He expects Harry to pay for everything while he goes off to the pub. I can't believe the audacity of this man. So, before we can buy anything, we need to take out some money from Gringotts and- Whoa! Why is the floor so slippy? Dude, how long have you been polishing this? Before you can take the money out, you need to collect 10 of these forms. And once you do that, the goblins will make you, the 11 year old, take control of the cart to collect the coins. Which aren't in a vault like a sensible bank. No, they're just here, there and everywhere. Is this place just a free for all? And let me tell you something, I hate this level. The cart feels extremely heavy to control, and there are times when you have to spin round in order to collect the coins, which is a problem when you are travelling at high speeds, because by the time the game notifies you that you'll need to spin all the way, you don't have enough time to gather momentum to make the loop. You also need to fill up this meter so that the three large coins are highlighted. If you don't, you have to repeat the stage all over again. Look at that, I'm only one coin short! ONE COIN! And you want to know what the worst part about this is? You have to do both the form minigame and the cart minigame three times! I smell padding. 
Oh, the goblins also mention that there are bonus gems that you can collect here as well, but the game doesn't explain what you get from collecting them or how many you need. As far as I was concerned, these done absolutely nothing. It wasn't until I started writing this script that I thought to Google it, and as it turns out, if you collect 65 of these gems, you'll get a wizard card. And by 65 gems, I don't mean 65 between all three card games, I mean 65 gems for each of them. That's three wizard cards you can win here, and the game does nothing to tell you that. Remember, the internet wasn't the same back in 2001. Not everyone had access to it, and I think the chances of you finding a walkthrough would be pretty slim. So if your goal was to collect all the witches and wizards cards, and you didn't have this information, you'd be in for quite a shock. I walk out of Gringotts thinking that life couldn't get any harder, but unfortunately, I ended up walking into Ollivander's looking for a peacock feather. This. This right here takes the cake for the worst level in this game hands down. In order to gain a feather, you need to be touching the peacock until this feather meter is full. Good luck with that though, because the peacock moves significantly faster than you, and if you try to use Flipendo to stun it, Ollivander gives you a good telling off and you have to start the level all over again. At first I tried walking up to it slowly, but it ran away before I could even get close. I even found an invisibility token thinking that this would help, but it didn't, the peacock still ran away. And if it wasn't hard enough already, you need to do it before the clock runs out and get three feathers. I thought this game was for children. Then, Ollivander has the audacity to charge you money. What the hell am I paying you for? You didn't do anything. That's like if I got on a bus, paid the fare and the driver gave me the wheel. In fact, the next two shops also seem to be in favour of child labour, but thankfully the tasks you are given aren't anywhere near as frustrating as the last one. In Ilop's Owl Emporium, you use Wingardium Leviosa to feed this owl a treat in order to get a feather from it. In the Magical Menagerie, you have to collect warts off a toad which keeps hiding in these boxes. But you can't shoot the boxes willy-nilly. No, you have to aim the boxes that shake, otherwise the shopkeeper will complain that you're wrecking her shop. Ever thought maybe you should be doing this job then? After all that, we end up in the Forbidden Forest looking for a wounded unicorn. Now this level wasn't included in the PC version, so it was nice for it to show up here, especially given the fact that it means Voldemort gets a proper introduction. Don't get me wrong, he's still introduced far too late and there's still a bunch of stuff that doesn't make any sense. For example, we see in this 3D cutscene that Harry's scar starts to hurt when Voldemort looks at him. Keep in mind that the idea of Harry's scar burning hasn't been acknowledged until now. Hell, I'm pretty sure that the scar itself has never been mentioned either, so it kind of looks a bit goofy when Harry grunts and faints. While doing this part in 3D might be cool and ominous, I think it would have been a lot better to have it told as a storybook just so that the narrator could explain what's happening, especially since the rest of the scene gets played like that anyway. Also, I love the fact that despite Voldemort's name never being mentioned up until now, it's said that Harry just knew that he was under the hood. How? How on earth could you possibly know that? After that, Hagrid gives us a flute which will come in handy to make Fluffy fall asleep later on. We first use it on a barn owl to learn the basic mechanics. As you might suspect at this point, it's another button pressing minigame. All you have to do is push the buttons in order. The layout never changes and the speed in which you press them have no negative effects on the music. You would think some musical elements would be incorporated in here, like each button representing a specific note or at the very least make the timing important. Finally, I can roam the castle again. So, off I go to trade those beans, but because it took so long for me to get back here, I can't remember where the portrait is. I turn around and see that all the doors are locked except for one. I've completely forgotten the fact that there's a table floating up and down and it's currently out of sight, and guess what happens? I trigger the next part of the story and can't back out. Well, I suppose if I really wanted to, I could reload a save, but at this point I'm so close to finishing the game and the rewards have hardly been worth it, so I carry on and google it afterwards. It's basically a more powerful version of Flipendo, charging it up doesn't take nearly as long and it deals a bit more damage. Of course the only time the game will let you access it is when you're just about to finish the game. It's such a shame because the whole concept of these secret portraits had so much potential, but three of the prizes are completely useless and the one that isn't you can't access until the end of the game. How disappointing. Well, it's been a bit of a roller coaster getting to this point, but now it's time for the final battle against Voldemort. For the most part, it plays out the same as the PC version. 
knocked these pillars onto his head and eventually cast Flopendo into the mirror of Erised to charge it up and blast him. It's a fairly straightforward fight, although these magic ropes tend to keep appearing which can be a little bit annoying. I think they show up if you get hit by this green spell, but if that's the case then there's a serious issue with the hit detection. I mean look how far away I am! I managed to get a good chunk of his health down before we are treated to this lovely sight. This makes me feel uncomfortable. Here you just have to keep mashing the square button to make sure you don't lose health and then hit X when the game tells you to, to deal damage. And uh, that's it. We then get the final storybook cutscene where everyone's happy and Gryffindor wins the house cup. I sat through the unskippable credits just in case there was anything afterwards and guess what? There is! Another view of the house points. Didn't you literally just say we won? Why did you feel the need to say it again? And so there we have it, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone on the PS1. I hate to say it, but it's pretty terrible. Despite the fact that I enjoyed playing it as a kid, the whole game feels incredibly messy and unfocused, especially if you compare it to the PC port. While neither of them do a good job of telling the story and some of the mechanics are still underdeveloped, the PC version just felt a lot less frustrating. The PlayStation version does have a bit of charm to it, I'm not gonna lie, but I'm willing to bet that if it hadn't been for the fact it was classed as a Harry Potter game, it probably wouldn't have been remembered. Now there's one more port of Philosopher's Stone that I want to cover, which is the PlayStation 2 version, but I'm not going to cover that until I do Chamber of Secrets first. And the reason for that is that the PS2 version of Philosopher's Stone came out after Chamber of Secrets, and I want to do a comparison of the two to see if they made any improvements. I hope you enjoyed this video and look forward to seeing you next time when I cover Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets on the PC.